Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the May 2023 Indicator of Behavior Subproject meeting uh, under the Open Cybersecurity Alliance. Uh, my name is Charlie Frick from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. For those that don't know me, I'm the uh, chair of the subproject. And today, uh, to help accommodate you know, different times and stuff, we'd like to normally we'll do some a general discussion for the project. We'll get towards that a little bit later. I'd like to jump right into our technical uh, talk today. We're very lucky to have uh, Francesco from uh, Standard Charter and, and the High Value Target Methodology Project uh, out in the EU. And he's willing to share with us some information about some of the things we're looking at. For those that were on last month's call, we saw that there was some unique opportunity for how we might want to start thinking about representing things like infrastructure and tools uh, inside some of the knowledge graphs that we're looking at. And so I thought it'd be good for us all to be familiar with what, what they're doing on the high value target uh, effort. So Francesco, with that said, I'll hand the mic over to you, sir, and let you uh, get started. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles, and thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. Once again, I will speak today on behalf of, of uh, clearly myself and, and as well my partner in crime, which is Karin, who couldn't be with us today. He would be in future instances. So um, uh, I slightly amended the deck today just to try to focus it on, on, on the IOB project. So there are certain assumptions that, that we've made and certain use cases that are like broader that may tie to a risk management framework or like some more structural aspects of doing cybersecurity work, including architecture. But we, we try to just focus um, on, um, on this use case. This is us. So well, um, we both work in the cyber resilience space, but we come from um, um, hands-on like third form defense background, both of us. Uh, on my side, I lead as well the global ICSA.org cyber resilience special interest group with now actually 1,700 people. Um, I co authored the World Economic Forum Cyber Resilience Index and uh, data, voting, uh, data voting consideration um, document with the Association of Banks in Asia Pacific. Um, so uh, we are very invested in the, in the research work or like exploring further ways of doing things. And the problem that we're trying to to address is somehow, as I mentioned, uh, is a bit structural if you think about the way how we as defenders, we look at the value of assets. So we, there is sometimes like a skewed view where um, the business attributes the value of assets. Um, I think in this specific case, like assets as application systems, we, we, we can enter in more detail on the semantics and looking at sub some models and like how do we define actually an asset. But for now, let's think about it as an application and it, all its underlying um, system underneath. So the business oftentimes may actually attribute value to certain assets because they are critical to, to run the company. Um, from, a, from a customer point of view, a business point of view. Uh, however, oftentimes uh, our current um, provided like tools like business impact analysis, um, part of, a, of every basically risk management framework, they do not account for the value of the adversary on those given assets. So as a result, we as Defender, we inherit oftentimes a list of key critical assets, like business, business critical assets, which oftentimes are defined by a BAA process which has a lot of um, considerations for the availability of assets, does not account for the threat piece. Um, oftentimes as well, this list of assets is actually provided then to CTI teams for requests for intelligence, for various purposes, maybe even for inside the threat programs. Here's the list of critical assets, but that's as well oftentimes derived from a BAA exercise. So what we want to do here is actually uh, not think only about the crown jewels, so these key assets that are business critical, but looking as well as um, at all of the other underpinning assets that, um, uh, that are mission critical and uh, enterprise essential. So this is more or less the, the problem statement. For this specific context, 
uh, we are saying, and I know this is a bit of a stretch, but I want to just to frame it. Just we, we probably have like, if I don't speak sticks language here, it's like this is not going to be of value. So uh, we did some initial investigation, and we think, hey, but well, what we're trying to say somehow, well, it sounds new, but on the other end, there are there is already work that possibly started in this space, but did not, in our view, materialize. So for example, uh, the way how sticks 2.1 defines tool is like legitimate software that can be used uh, by threat actors. However, um, how, we, how often do we see in like, you know, attack trees or other artifacts, uh, specific like um, assets, software components that are called out in this category. As well, the, the tool label possibly are actually attributes of tools uh, that can be thwarted against, against us as defenders. And so, yes, there is something available, but we went a bit farther to try to define those dictionaries or like those, those aspects. This is actually put into a frame of um, NIST 800 and NIST 800 for enhanced controls for high value assets or high value targets. And, uh, and the way how actually we think about defending our, our enterprise. So is MITRE beyond attack almost. So MITRE, thinking about MITRE craft, which is cyber resilience engineering framework, thinking about MITRE defend and the, the cyber sub, uh, survivability attributes. So uh, the traditional approach of threat form defense driven by MITRE, that's absolutely key. What we want is actually to put this in the context of a cyber resilient enterprise. So once again, there's four key differences between a cyber secure enterprise, often focused on, um, on cyber resistance. But here we're putting like um, a different view, which is very much endorsed by regulators all around, uh, starting from uh, well, the SEC and US uh, uh, entities, but as well the, I seen even recently in the White House, Physical Cyber Resilience Task Force. Um, in DORA, UDORA, the UK, uh, PRA and FCA regulations on operational resilience, the Singapore ones, the Hong Kong ones, the, and there's more, right? So, uh, so there are more use cases for this, but they fit more towards like a, a cyber resilience engineering type of work. So I, I actually limited that view for the purpose of this talk. As well, uh, the hybrid target concept is not something per se that we want to live on its own. Actually, we want to use what's available. There's two things that are currently available. One is the list of high value assets. So this definition is out there from 20, 2015. But when we talk to various organizations, we say, well, do you adopt like, do you adopt like a, a specific way of designating your, your high value assets? And Oftentimes, it's depending on the company your jurisdiction is dictated or demanded by regulator uh, nomenclature and and and, uh, and, uh, and definitions. On on other in other cases, it's actually customized. Maybe his, for historical reasons, something was defined a crown jewel, so it's just carried over. But the have a asset concept is quite quite well. It's very well defined and. We had a chance. I had a chance to work with some of these um, these people that worked on on the high value asset concept from USC. And the we actually went in and added some more detailed guidelines uh, given our threat informed defense background. The other list of definitions of what is critical is the NIST Executive Order fourteen zero twenty eight, uh, which is well from a couple of years ago. Didn't get a ma much of a press time, honestly, but it actually defines a list of um, categories of critical software. Again, like knowing this, right? Knowing that the adversaries are going after this stuff, what are we doing about it in our day to day, right? So uh, this is this is a bit of an intro then to the high value targets um, and, and what they are. So I'll show you in a moment. Before I show you though, like a short forward on, on on a couple of aspects. So first of all, if you say, oh yeah, but I've already seen some similar methodologies for defining asset criticality. So we have researched this for like over, a, or over like maybe a couple of years at least. And um, there are already books, literature out there that some of it is captured in this one slide, but what we have 
is actually an informed view based on multiple uh, existing uh, materials, but is not a duplicate of those. Um, as well, we, we believe the need is out there for this methodology uh, because if we want to actually focus on the advanced adversaries, right? So we have to account for the adversarial volatility. And if something didn't happen today on a given asset, on a given CVE, well then let's pivot back to the CWE, let's pivot back to the CPE for the class of those assets. And then, uh, and then let's do something about it. So almost it's something that we believe uh, maybe over positive, but could actually help moving towards predictive cyber threat intelligence. Uh, and we'll be presenting this concept um, in a couple of weeks at the FSI SAC Europe, um, Europe Summit in, in the UK. Uh, so this is the methodology. It's, it's done out of two phases. Um, so the first one is actually uh, the one where we place the assets in uh, uh, four different buckets. I almost think that this could be from a sticks point of view, like some additional detail in the in the tool, uh, SDO itself, and uh, and uh, currently companies already like do a good job in identifying what is most valued from a data standpoint or informational value, which is what you see on the bottom right. However, we have not seen a, a quantitative way to actually identify the high value targets uh, based on. Uh, or for the other three categories. So anything that is, uh, I think this resonates pretty well with you, like when we talk to maybe some uh, less technically savvy audiences when we, we go into minor detail, but in this case, you probably seen incidents that happen on those, on those tools. So what we're saying is that if something falls in one of these categories, the critical infrastructure control plane or protective and defensive tools, actually these assets, while they provide defensive capabilities to us, they can actually as well be exploited by the adversaries and turn them against us. That's one use case. The other one is actually the adversaries from a control pressure standpoint, they will actually want to target those quite often because they know that the defender, right, will actually leverage some of these capabilities to implement countermeasures and implement specific um, emergency playbooks based on what they're seeing. So we, um, we, we actually capture these into, into these um, categories. We, what you see here is um, uh, these examples like DNS, backup and storage. And so these are examples, it's not an ex exhaustive list. Uh, we have like a bigger list that is available. So the, if, suppose that I'm an organization, I say, okay, I like the concept. Uh, I like to implement it. You would first go through phase one, you take your CMDB. So your inventory of assets, wherever it is, we actually we're working as well on a, on a service now module to do this like a bit better than just on Excel files. So you just go on your CMDB and you identify uh, what uh, is the class of the asset, um, and then you and you just attribute that class to the asset. So if you have something that falls within one of those, then uh, you move to the next phase. And in next phase, we have. Uh, we have the 10 attributes of high value targets, which possibly in our view could be something that fits to the stick 6.2, so the tool label. So it's something a bit more like a vocabulary value that is a bit more granular. So somehow this, we actually codified um, these, these, uh, uh, these attributes in a way that is leaves, actually gives the right amount of guidance uh, to, to anyone who wants to look at their own inventory and actually find what is the value of these assets from an adversarial standpoint. What, from our experience, again, here there are three of these attributes that are already very well categorized in most companies and addressed. One is external exposure. So most organizations have seen like when they have something externally exposed, they protect it pretty strongly. They have additional governance, extra controls, and so on. The, the ones that actually store secrets, so the various, act, the various directories, the various privilege access management tools, the, you know, any of those Java key stores, if you're lucky, then they are already pretty well protected because they store secrets. So it's easy to understand. And then the other one is if something stores data, uh, like databases and, and, and structure and structured data, then as well, they are oftentimes, they land into that critical list. But the other attributes, 
not much. It's oftentimes something that depends on um, on on the experience of the of the security team and the ability that they have to influence and to challenge the business or or other um, teams that do business continuity and assign those ratings uh, to the assets. So the uh, so once again, so here they are split actually during in the free for simplicity purposes we use the simplified kill chain. So if something provides stealthiness, uh, so provides basically a little a little challenge uh, in terms of being able to just, for example, whitelist um, any uh, rule or any or any ex ex executable on the on the console of that specific software or application, then it's something that provides stealthiness. So as an adversary. I would want to actually um, uh, go after that specific set of tools um, in order to further advance my mission. And that is at the pre-compromise pre phase. Or if something gives me visibility into the control plane, think about network management tools or well, the famous solar winds, that would be something for possibly internal perspective, internal prospecting, or as well something that is tamper prone and white, it has widespread presence, right? So we actually did this effort to codify those. Here there are some more, uh, so here there is a more description to what these are. Now, I don't think that this type of description would actually possibly land into like a, something that is sticks, but it could be additional guidance as part of maybe this work group, if, if we want to do it, that, that could actually, uh, further help to identify what these um, high value targets are, that's one. But then secondly, if we are uh, like users, like CTI users of, of sticks, then um, it helps us just, it's almost like a, um, like a reference material that we can use and say, okay, yeah, this specific tool software, yeah, let me just add this label or that label. So it's like guidance. So here is the, uh, take, uh, take like internal perspective, right? So if the if the assets provide structured, extensive, and granular visibility into the environment that can be then leveraged for malicious purposes, that's something that has high attacker value. High attacker value in the in the in, in terms of voice of the adversary, right? You may be familiar with voice of the customer for like designing good UI interfaces, but the voice of the adversary is something that is used in Cranjewel analysis, uh, in various MITRE, MITRE publications, you will see that. So high attacker value, that's what we have. And then medium or low is just simply lower than that. Um, once again, here we focus, this is fairly important on what we, uh, what we define as the inherent impact of those specific assets. So it's not a residual risk. So we don't want, this is something just that that specific tool provides you. Right, so if you have directory service, that's what it does. We don't consider here like what is uh, the set of controls or countermeasures that you have in place to reduce the risk from in high inherent risk down to low residual risk. That's something else. Here we just say these are these these applications just are designed to do that, and their functionalities can be then uh, they offer uh, certain adversarial uh, value for the avenues of. Uh, of a, from a key chain perspective. Um, here is just an example of how I do. So if, if I want to just categorize um, through the first phase tools like directory services or something like a SCCM or like some tool for managing uh, my, my server state and patching them and configuring them, then I would just give these scores like almost like a yes or no. And I get this score. Then I move to the next phase and then I just give uh, free values like low, medium, high, and this can be as sophisticated as someone wants to, but we try to keep it simple. And then out of it, you get a specific score. So you see how this is programmatic. It can be actually possibly implemented and possibly you would then be able suddenly in, in the view of exchanging information between peer organizations. And so you can actually suddenly say that, yes, well, what you consider high value as asset that's what as well I consider as high value, right? So we talk suddenly the same language, we can share uh, what we are seeing and we can actually talk the same language. Um, we can use as well um, the one, of, we can take one of the five strategic design principles of cyber resilience 
And actually, and unfortunately here, you, I realize that you don't see very well the arrows, but we built like a little attack tree. This is based on the MAR SCCM tool, a tool by Phil Kimmel uh, from Netitude. And there's others, but it, this is almost like a, um, a, well, an attack graph in a way, something that can be used during threat modeling. And you can actually see how SCCM can be weaponized. But then here's a the question. How many organizations we've seen where SCCM is treated as a high value target? Uh, yeah, some, it depends again, it depends on, on, on the maturity of that team and so on and, and how well they've been able to justify that, yeah, we need extra controls, we need extra investment for that specific asset, right? Um, so here are some more, uh, some other uses based on the security architecture SAP's uh, uh, life cycle from strategy, strategy and planning down to measure and, uh, and, and manage. Um, and here are some users that typically on an engagement for identifying the high value targets, they will actually be engaged, but a bit out of scope for, for the group. And so in a nutshell, what we're saying is, um, well, we have a, a copy of the methodology that can be downloaded if you're interested, but I'd be happy to just, you know, personally just take a look at that, who is requesting it, and then I'll just share it with you. And, and then uh, we're, we're looking for feedback, like both on the, on the attributes that we've chosen, on the categories, uh, and do you see relevance as much as we see it for the indicators of behavior? That's one. And then two, we will very clear that we, we are STIX users, but we're not STIX experts. So um, we, we'd leverage any help that someone maybe um, can spend a few hours with us. If there is interest, we, we have, you have all our support to then just um, uh, working on this together and, and help come up with possibly a solution. Something that I didn't call out is a bigger idea, a bigger plan to actually even go later and look at the, the NIST CP, so the common product enumerations, because that would be something that would be quite powerful once we first address sticks. Then if we, if we were able to attribute, to, to, to place the um, assets that are being impacted um, into classes of CVEs, then the, it would tie back to, to the CVEs. And, and it would give us like a very interesting view. Francesco, first of all, thank you for all that. I know Jason has a question and has to run, run off uh, quickly soon. Um, so I wanted to give a second for him to ask his question sure. before we, he had to leave. Oh, th thank you, Charlie. <laughs> uh, so first of all, Francesco, great presentation. This is amazing work. I'm interested in learning more actually, um, which is kind of tied to my question. So. You know, I'm trying to figure out. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what high value target is. I, I kind of went to your website while you were talking and was looking through it, and you know, there's uh, you know descriptions about the methodology, but then there's like talk about copyright and all these things. So I'm trying to figure out: is, is this like a community? Are you who who is high value target? How would how would the IOB working group get engaged in, in this work or, or anybody else who wants to be involved? Um, that part uh, was something I didn't quite get. All right, so the, um, the, the high value type, all of what you have seen is something that we, 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 we I came up with and Kalin has contributed to it and it's just something open for the community to use, right? Um, and we'd like to just ensure that, once again, it does not become a product um, on its own. We, we wouldn't want that. It's rather something that we would like to ensure that the, the categories and the attributes are something that uh, are available for, the, for specific like community tools to actually to leverage. One of them is as well the NIST 800, 160 and MITRE CREF. Uh, there's a tool called Craft Navigator from MITRE, uh, which has some mention of high value targets, but I'm, we, I'm working with MITRE to actually try to expand on that a little bit more. So again, there's the open, like the, the community version of it that is like fully, fully open with the attributes as well. And that's why I'm going to share the, um, the white paper so that you can read more if you want to like, 
in terms of what the methodology is, the definition of a high value target, right? Because potentially high value target could be even more than an asset or a system. It could be a high value target role, high value target third party and the high value target data. So that's some additional work that, that we're doing in that space to just research that. Um, then in terms of right, additional um, like help, if an organization wants to go and implement and review, for example, their whole CMDB and they need some help with that methodology, then that, that's a separate discussion, right? But um, the, um, the, the concept is something that, that we created for the, for, for the, for the community. I mean, we're users of MitreTag and all those tools, and, and that's just something that, that was created to be out there for the community. Not sure if it helps, um, or if you have some, some other concerns, and then you know, we can you know, work and address those for sure. Yeah, I'm just I trying to figure out how to. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Charlie. No, go ahead, Jason. You first. No, I was just gonna say, and and I know Charlie knows this too. Like, like we've been trying to. One of the things that we've been trying to do is define because Sticks doesn't actually have the concept of asset either, right? So the OCA we created a new Sticks extension for asset, right? So when you're talking about, you know, how do we how do we communicate some of the information you were just talking about in your presentation? That to me would be a locus of probably some of this. You've got to first have the object that represents the asset that you're trying to enumerate risk for in the first place, right? So to me, there's like some natural synergies here between some things that we already had to do and some of the things that you were just talking about and looking for, um, you know, guidance mm -hmm. and sticks modeling. So um the, we'll chart. oh sorry right so, so Jason, the, the asset um object is isn't something that was present in the previous version of sticks and then was removed or maybe i'm wrong i cannot recall if sticks one dot x back in the bygone eras had asset or not but it, it never existed in the 2.0 stream forward right, so it didn't exist right. in 2.0 or 2.1 um, yeah. <laughs> okay okay got it so um okay i, I will i will look at that because i, I think it's yeah we had to create one and there's in the oca extensions there's an asset information one um and it's it. it's not as robust as it needs to be it needs a lot more work and thought put to it um but but yeah, I, I think there's a, a natural opportunity here because this whole notion of like applying risk to assets is is really important. Mm -hmm. So, Absolutely. and Jason, Jason, I'll include the right one, but it's the OCA sticks extensions repo, correct? Yes. So, I I need to look into this, Charlie. We have work to do to create actual official sticks extensions for some of the yeah. objects. Like there, uh, there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a longer, it's a longer chat, but yes, uh, <laughs> I, I've got a lot, I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of my plate and my team's plate on that line. <laughs> oh, it's not just, it's not just yours. Like, so like in the stick shifter project, there's a bunch of custom objects that are returned and those are documented like in the stick shifter documentation, but there's no like actual we don't have the official extension published anywhere. Um, that's like a gap that needs to be closed. I'm just throwing in the uh, chat for a quick reference. The uh, the asset page right now on the OCA. Yeah, I'll have a, see ex I'll exactly. Have a so this is like a, there yeah, so exactly, Charlie. So this is like a documentation page, <laughs> but like there's no. Like, it's marked down, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there, this is a markdown document, which is good. It's at least we're publishing it, but like we don't have the actual .json extension as defined in Sticks 2.1. That that needs to be created. Yep. Got it. All right. So and this will actually almost give though like the the information about you see the the asset information, right? So the like name of the host, the ID of the device and so on. However, it would not give the information from a adversarial standpoint, Well, it wouldn't give like the class 
of that type of asset, right? So it will tell we, you this is, right? We could Yeah, but that, our point is, right? though, it, it could. It could, yeah, yeah, that's so true, we, yeah. Seeing that we're, you know, it's kind of getting to the point, it's like, this yeah, is one absolutely. avenue where we could implement mm -hmm. it. Just wanted to make sure, like, have you guys looked at assigning a open source license to the methodology? I, I'm I'm a newbie in that space because this is like the the, the um, no I did not so I will investigate so what, that for sure yes that might also help protect some of your mm -hmm. concerns I know not plug in some other work I did but in some other work I've had to make methodologies and we've just released we've released like the papers under a Creative Commons or a Apache two or whatever license was GNU or whatever would fit best and that was one way that we would do that in the past to help Got it. when you when you want to make sure that it's something for the community and you want to guarantee it's not inadvertently productized that, that, that yeah that's the main issue yes well uh, if it's possible i will catch up with you maybe separately uh, if you have Absolutely. some advice uh, yeah that would be perfect I'll, we'll follow up i'll i'll share some examples from mm -hmm. that from that effort and excellent mm -hmm. And always, and always disclaimer that I am not a lawyer and I always call one before I pick the open source license to put on a GitHub repo. Uh, yeah. Uh, excellent. And I think we could have, yeah, I've got risk analysis is a big research interest of mine outside of what I do here on IOB. I have a few thoughts that I'll also follow up with you, I think, afterwards because I don't want to I could easily go on for the next 25 minutes geeking out on risk assessment and I'm sure everybody else would be ecstatic to hear that for the next 25 minutes but uh, I think we can get some feedback and we can investigate maybe this opportunity on the sticks extensions and particularly the asset uh, expanding the asset uh, definition could be a very good place for high value uh, target methodology to have, we can make it an optional field, like we can make a part of the, the proposed extension where it can be filled in with a reference dictionary. And if someone isn't assigning that data yet, there's still a place to hold it. Absolutely. Yeah, this sounds great. And th this is, I, I see that it was updated um, two weeks ago, right? the this one the the asset ticket so it's something that is in flight yeah got it is there like a timeline for these like do they go through a committee like is it like a yearly thing or is there we probably need we can we should have some discussions and structure that out some more uh, i don't okay. know the exact timelines right now but got it got it thank you very much if, if there's any other question from from anyone you know Happy to, to take yeah. these or as well, um, I'll pink here my email address, uh, just in case anyone wants to reach out and, and have some suggestions. Uh, we, there are even some other attributes that we're looking into and this is going to actually evolve as the sophistication of the adversaries evolve. So one of the other five strategic design principles from this and from the So there's, if, if, an if an asset is automatable, so automatable as, a, as an attribute, and if an asset is autonomous, um, that's another one. So th there's more that may actually come up and possibly, you know, uh, I actually created like a GitHub page to actually collect feedback from the community. I, I did not maybe still a good job to kind of promote it because I wanted firstly to sync up with you guys and, uh, and, and decide together. And... Absolutely. And Francesco, just confirming, you're fine if I share your email on the listserv and the Slack for questions related to this? Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. I, like to, I like to verbally confirm before I do it. <laughs> sure. It's hard to undo. <laughs> All righty. Well, does anybody have any additional questions? If not, I, I'll just thank Francesco and go into some of our additional topics for, today, for today's meeting. But, uh, open the floor real quick. Does anybody have any HVTM questions? All right. Well, sir, thank you. We're, I am more than happy to have you for the remainder of our call, but also understand if you might have some things you need to do this evening. So just thank you so much. And we'll definitely be 
and more in touch with you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Absolutely. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Alrighty. Thank you. So, so everyone, um, that was, I thought that was an important conversation to have. So that was my main focus for this month. And I think Jason, unfortunately, had to leave us. But obviously, OCA is a big coalition of the willing. And we are doing our best to stay as organized as possible. But I do think he really hit on something that the, uh, the Sticks Extensions uh, repo on the OCA GitHub really, we've been looking at a lot of these more piecemeal across Kestrel, Stick Shifter, IOB, and Pace. And I think at the next TSC uh, Technical Steering Committee meeting, I'm going to bring up the idea about maybe we use this repo as a larger focus to the OASIS Threat Intel Committee on how to propose some updates to sticks for version 2.2 and essentially to help establish a de facto you know, set of expected extensions. And that will require some larger discussions, of course. But I think this is a great opportunity, not just for what Francesca was talking about, but for all of our IOB research, as well as the other projects. Um, that said, uh, I forgot to give my monthly plug that the uh, we're maintaining the repo just fine. But if anybody has interest in having access, please let myself or Kurt Korolenko know and we can talk to you about signing a contributor license agreement to be a maintainer on the repo. I'd mention that not as a side-handed way to guilt anybody into joining us on GitHub, but more, I don't want the even the appearance that APL is trying to hold ownership of the repo. We're, we're glad to continue doing this. If anybody else wants to also be a maintainer, feel free to reach out to me and we'll be glad to have you on board. Um, I also will post in the chat, since we last met, we also got a, a dedicated IOB page on the OCA web, website. Before, I used to have a link to our GitHub. Uh, I'll see how well I can share a portion for just a moment on my screen for a moment. So hopefully everybody is now seeing the OCA IOB page. It's just a quick little uh, summary with a link to the uh, link to the GitHub as well as the video that we were that we got released on the OCA website. So just sharing that might eventually uh, I'll talk to Claudia and see if we might also eventually include the blog post and any other uh, relevant news uh, on there as well. But uh, OCA called me up and said that they wanted to have a little dedicated, they're working to have these dedicated splash pages for each project beyond the GitHubs. And so that's out there. Uh, with that, I wanted to quickly move over to some group discussion. I was unfortunately not able to attend the OCA breakfast at RSA. I wasn't sure if anybody on the call was able to attend. So I thought I'd ask real quick. I'll take that as I'll take that as a no, and that's okay. I know J I know Jason was there, but unfortunately he had to leave early today. Um, from what I can share secondhand from sitting in on the CASP meetings and a few others, sounds like it was well attended. I know that there was an abridged version of our IOB video uh, available to, to be played up there. I haven't heard a lot of the initial response to that. Uh, sorry that I wasn't able to be out to San Francisco this year to, to promote it, but we will uh, continue. I will also let you guys know that we are, I am working a couple uh, conference opportunities to present some of our work. Uh, Vasilios Mavridis and I will be having a discussion about IOB and cacao at the, uh, I'm gonna say it wrong, but the Attack EU workshop at the end of May. Uh, it's gonna be a virtual event and we will 
we'll be doing a 15 minute lightning talk on that, as well as a few other events uh, coming later in the summer that I'll be able to share more details once we have all the uh, releaseability handled. Um, and, but we are continuing to kind of push those. With CAP, the CASP project, uh, there's been some active discussion and I need to push back a little more to, to help out some more there. But I think we're targeting, I know they're targeting a July deadline for some demonstration. Uh, I'd like very much to represent some of the data in an IOB bundle, which we're willing to do on our end uh, so that if we have a Kestrel hunt, some Kestrel hunt books, we can easily put those into a detection group with some stick shifter queries as detections uh, to line up to show some interoperability. And I believe there'll be some more opportunities as we get closer to borderless cyber in September. But just putting it out there for everyone that if folks are interested in building some IOB objects, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, Always, you know, you can email the listserv and that will definitely get to me, but also uh, charles.frick at ghuapl.edu because I have great trust in my spam filter. And uh, so anyhow, <clears throat> it's not lost on me that stuff is monitoring the audio in YouTube. If you don't believe me, uh, play with the Bard AI chatbot and there's definitely some things that it's gotten from voice to text. Uh, but anyhow, I will open the floor real quick because I know I just kind of, again, rambled for five minutes nonstop without breathing and wanted to see if anybody had questions on all the things that we've been discussing today. I will take that awkward silence as full support, <laughs> and I'm always grateful for it. Oh. Uh, but then in that case, I will think we'll get a little bit closer to a wrap up unless anybody has any, uh, final, uh, parting thoughts they'd like to share with the group. Uh, feel free to raise your hand or just interrupt me and I'll let you do that. Otherwise I will say, you know, real quick, anybody have anything they want to say at all? And that's fine. Yeah. In that case, I thank you all very much. We will meet up again in June. I will uh, send out an agenda. I'm, to be frank, I'm still identifying the right technical talk, but I th there's a few options that I think could be uh, viable candidates. And so thank you all. And we'll keep things live on the Slack and listserv along a few of these efforts for the uh, the Sticks Extension repo as CASP and other outreach efforts. So thank you all for your time and have a wonderful uh, day. Thanks, Charles. Stop the recording now. You're welcome. <laughs>